Well, hello, good evening, and welcome to episode 56 of Humanity versus Insanity. And sadly, the insanity seems to be being ramped up, of course, in the Middle East, an area that uh, very few people in the UK certainly have actually travelled to. And if they have, it's been to the tourist destinations uh, such as Sharm el Sheikh, uh, Cairo or Dubai. Uh, but very few have been to the more remote areas and very f certainly even fewer have been into uh, Syria. And uh, even fewer than that have been into Palestine. Well, I'm blessed tonight with my guest, Max Egan, because not only is it stupid o'clock right now in uh, Queensland, so uh, once uh, the show is finished, Max assures me that he's heading straight back to bed. Um, unfortunately, he only just discovered that uh, we do the show as video. So uh, um, he does ask for your uh, tolerance if he doesn't necessarily look at his best. But uh, Max, uh, the fact he's awake is, um, is good news because Max has uh, endured a pretty rough ride over the last couple of weeks. So uh, Max, are you there? Is, have you managed to get the uh, first coffee down? I have, mate. Cup of tea. I'm not a coffee drinker, but I'm having my cup of tea. I actually didn't get the first cup of tea down. The first cup of tea went all over my desk, but uh, the second cup of tea I'm getting down. Well, it's that time of the morning. Hey, uh, Max, I really appreciate you uh, uh, getting out of bed for us. But uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to give you um, the platform to uh, talk about what happened after your recent experience at the Freedom Summits uh, conference in um, uh, Byron Bay. Well, I got jumped. I, I left, the, uh, left the conference. At, at the summit, there was a, a heckler there. Uh, during my my talk, and actually had me on first, and um, there was a, a woman there who got up and heckled all during my talk. She was there from the Israeli lobby. Apparently, she'd flown from Israel just to come to the Freedom Summits. I would suggest because myself and Ken O'Keefe were booked to be speaking there. Ken didn't actually make it into the country, but she uh, she was there um, uh, heckling all through my performance. And then when I finished, she, uh, she didn't listen to any other speakers. She sat in the hallway and handed out pro-Israeli flyers to people all day. And then the next day she showed up and they wouldn't let her in. And her anger levels went through the roof. And then uh, that evening, the second evening of the, of the summit, I got followed back to a restaurant and I got attacked when I left the restaurant. I got jumped from behind as I was walking back to my car. It was very, very quick. Like I had I have no idea who it was. It was a, it was a large individual. But... There were like a few blows to the back of the head, maybe three or four blows to the back of the head. And then I went down and a few boots around the ribs and uh, it was over in, in less than a minute, you know, probably less than 30 seconds. It was very, very quick. And I was kind of left there lying on the ground, dazed and stunned. I was told that uh, I need to, need to know when to shut the F up. And uh, I was told as you walked away that it was a, it was a warning and next time it wouldn't be so kind. There's no way that I can say confirmed that this this was related to the summit, but I would suggest that it was. The man didn't rob me. Um, I had been very outspoken the day before. There were some pretty angry people there, people who were pretty angry with me, and then I get attacked the next day. It seems pretty obvious that that's what it was from. Of course, it was done about 50 kilometers away from the conference at a restaurant, So, and it's on the Gold Coast, so people can say, oh, well, you know, people get attacked on the Gold Coast all the time. And there was nobody but myself who heard what the individual said to me. So I have no way of actually proving anything. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that it was related to the conference. I wasn't robbed. Nothing was taken from me. It was over very quickly. It happened at, uh, at Burley Heads on the, on the, uh, the promenade uh, on the way up to the, the, the hill up to, up to uh, Burley Point. So it was quite a, a reasonably lit and, and you know, pretty. It was 9.30 on a Saturday night in Burley Heads. It was a pretty bold attack, you know. And the man got me in a shady spot where he was able to do it really quickly and just leave me there and nobody found me. And you know, I got up sort of you know, 20 minutes, half an hour later and staggered off to my car and went home. And, so it was, and a single, it was a single individual? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a single, single individual. I mean, it could have been a lot worse here. It could have been a lot worse. I could have got, uh, when I was on the ground, I, I thought that I was going to get killed. I, I mean, I was, I was pretty scared because I, I realised that I'm, I'm completely defenceless here. I'm a 58-year-old man. I've just been attacked from behind. I'm lying on the ground with someone putting the boot in. And you're in the dark, uh, off, off on your own. I mean, it's, it's a pretty scary sort of a situation to be in. 
but it could have been a lot worse. Um, of course, I went back to the summit the next day and I got up and spoke, and it, it, it's made me want to want to just speak out more. You know, I don't really. Uh, it hasn't hasn't dampened my spirits at all. It's it's made me realise what it's like to be a Palestinian. You know, a small taste of what it's like to be a Palestinian, and it's made me want to speak uh, even louder and and even more directly. So. I think it's affected. Uh, it's it's had the reverse effect of, of what it was intended. I think, but I'm pretty certain it was related to the to the event. I can't see any other reason for it. Um, out of the blue, someone telling me I need to shut up. I mean, this this sounds like it's related to the event, unless it's just somebody who listens to my radio shows and happened to recognise me and doesn't like what I say. I don't know. But um, I mean, most of what I've been saying lately is in defence of Palestine. And uh, things have been really ramping up over there to a ridiculous degree. So well, and of course, I mean, let, let's just remind people that I mean, you have absolute, uh, you have an absolute right to speak about Palestine. Because here's a, I got a shot here of you actually in Palestine a few years ago, um, and uh, of course you were there with Ken, um, and who of course is uh, yeah, equally as outspoken as, as you are. Uh, but you know, you two guys are um, the epitome of. Uh, positive activists, i.e. activists that actually go and uh, uh, walk the walk and, you know, show that uh, basically it's not about getting uh, stuck behind a keyboard. It is about, you know, um, going out there and meeting with the people and uh, then bringing their story back to Australia. And of course, you were in the uh, UK earlier this year at uh, AV6. So, you know, when you said that you had upset a few people at the uh, Freedom Summits event, what, what was it that you said that, that upset them? Well, I basically said that 9-11 had uh, Israeli fingerprints all over it, and I started showing video footage of what's actually going on in West Bank, some of the stuff that's being smuggled out to me by people in West Bank. Um, I have video footage of the recent bus attack. Uh, you might have heard about two Palestinians that got on a bus and shot and stabbed a whole bunch of Israelis. This attack did not happen. I have a friend who lives around the corner from where that happened in Hebron or in Jerusalem, and um, it didn't happen. The, the Israelis showed up with a bus. They got all the people calmly off the bus. The settlers showed up, shot the bus up. They brought a prisoner on board, and they shot him, and they said they were attacked by Palestinians. There were no Jewish victims. There was no Palestinian attack on that bus. It was completely staged and set up. Um, what's going on in Gaza and what's going on in West Bank is, is a program of ethnic cleansing. That's what's going on. Israel is, is a completely intolerant, racist, apartheid regime. And this is what I said. And it went down very badly with a couple of people. Um, they, they started handing out leaflets about how Israel is all about peace. And it's not. I mean, anybody who's gone there and met the Palestinian people would take the position that I've taken. It changed my life going to Palestine. It really did. I mean, I've often thought about Gaza and I've often thought about the, the plight of these people, but never really, never really, you know, not that much, you know, you, you don't, you just think, oh yeah, it's probably bad, but you know, you don't really think about it, you know, and you go over there and meet the people and you find that there, there aren't terrorists in Gaza, this is not a hotbed of terrorists, it's a prison full of children and, and women mainly, 35% Christians in Gaza Strip as well, so, and the Christians and the Muslims get on fine, they're not fighting with each other. There's women walking around without headdresses and all sorts of stuff in Gaza. It's a very, very uh, open society. If, the, if it would be able to be free and be able to uh, communicate with the rest of the world and have free trade with the rest of the world, it would be a, a great society. And Palestine is being wiped off the face of the map by what is essentially the, the most brutal, most rogue, most apartheid regime that's ever existed on this earth. And it needs to be addressed and it needs to be called out for what it is. Israel is an absolute pariah. And as far as I'm concerned, Gaza provides a key for all of us to address this entire situation because every, as far as I'm concerned, every politician on this planet that is supporting Israel in its perpetuation of Gaza Strip is a war criminal. Now, you want to know how to get rid of the fracking in your country? Understand that the guy who en enacted the legislation which allows the fracking is also probably supporting Israel and can therefore be arrested for war crimes under Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention if people stand up and call it. You know, Gaza Strip and, and Palestine in general is a, is a chance for the human race to open up their hearts and call this out for what it is. Get this ridiculous programmed concept out of your mind that this is a fight against Muslims and Jews or Palestinians and Israelis. What it is is children being held in collective prison by a rogue state that is being funded by all of our criminal politicians around this planet. And the only ones we're going to stop it is us, but we have to stand up and call it out. 
And that's what I'm encouraging people to do. And that's what I said in the talk. You know, we have to call this war crime out and stop supporting this war criminal state and its war criminal government. Because it's true. And it's absolutely, I mean, you know this here, it's true. Well, we've got to deal with this. We really do. And, and Palestine is giving us a key that we can use to arrest every single politician across this planet because they're all supporting war crimes. And if they're going to, if they're going to call any of their legislation, or if they're going to make me abide by any of their laws at all, well, what about this law? This, this paper that was written back in 1945 that says that all of you people are war criminals. And if I can show you war criminals through this paper, what makes any piece of legislation you guys have written valid? How is any of it valid? How is your right to rule anybody valid when you are a war criminal under your own legislation? And if you're going to ignore that, then I'm going to ignore everything you write on paper because that is my legal and moral duty to do so. And that is the stance that people have to take. We're going to call these people out. David Cameron is a brutal, blatant war criminal. He should be arrested and he should be put in jail. The fact that he isn't shows how incompetent the British police are. And it's the same in Australia. Malcolm Turdfall here, our Prime Minister. This guy's a Zionist ex-banker, openly supports Israel, managed to become a war criminal within 24 hours of becoming an unelected Prime Minister. That's got to be some sort of a record. You know, we've got to call these people out and, and deal with this situation. But it's going to be the people. The people have to do it. And that's the problem. People don't want to. They're too scared to. They're too scared to open their hearts. They're too scared to be honest. You know, they're just all politically correct and they think that there's, there's legal pathways we have to use. Well, sure, there's legal pathways, but you've got to call things out for what they are first. Don't be politically correct. Just name the names and call things for what they are. And I think we'll make a difference. Oh, and and we're, Gaza we're, and Palestine, mate, it makes you want to do it. It makes you want to do it, Ian. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the average age in Gaza, I think, is about 17 right now, isn't it? And, yeah, it is. It's 17 years old, bro. You know, and uh, as you say, I mean, it, it is just a, a war, a, a continuous war crime. And, you know, I have to give full credit to the likes of uh, Ilan Pape, um, who is a Jewish historian, um, was, may still be, based at Exeter University here in the southwest of England. But of course, he wrote the book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, and if any Gentile had written that book, then they would be absolutely persecuted um, because mm. they would be uh, labelled as an anti-Semitic or uh, you know, whatever. But Ilan Pape, of course, can write the book and it is essential reading. And the other person, of course, who we should acknowledge as well is Gilad Atzman, because oh, Gilad, sure. of course, uh, you know, calls it like it is. And, um, you know, they can and, and they're very important for the uh, uh, for, for, for the Jewish people, because it actually demonstrates that there is a fundamental difference between the Jewish people. OK, we know they're Kazarian, etc., but the Jewish people and the Zionist philosophy, which is, of course, about establishing greater Israel. And, and of course, as you know, we have, I think, discussed before, ISIS is a construct <coughs> that has been established for the primary purpose of creating greater Israel surreptitiously. Exactly. That's what ISIS is doing. Everything ISIS is attacking is, is part of the greater Israel project. It's just clearing the way for it. But a lot of people don't even notice, you know, like they're, they're going through Syria, they're rampaging through Syria. There's a pipeline that runs through Syria from Iraq down to Israel, which supplies them with all this oil. And ISIS haven't attacked the pipeline. The whole country is overrun by them. They're going, driving around this pipeline. They don't blow up Israeli's pipeline. I mean, you know, does this, does this say anything to anybody? I mean, these people are working for Israel. Of course they are. The whole thing has been staged by Israel. ISIS, and the whole the whole war on terror, the whole war on terror is essentially a proxy war for Israel, and it's the war for greater Israel. That's what it is. And we have to call it. People have to see it, and they have to call it. And, and you know, we're not going to solve any problems in the Middle East by bombing Damascus. You're not going to solve ISIS by, by bombing Damascus. You're going you're gonna to stop ISIS by cu cutting off the funding and cutting off the head of the snake and cutting off those who support ISIS who are in Washington and Wall Street and London and Brussels and Tel Aviv. That who is supporting... That and, is and, supporting uh, and Sydney, ISIS. well, Canberra. Well, yes, of course, and Canberra as well. I mean, you know, Malcolm Turnbull, 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 whatever his name is. I mean, yeah, man, this this guy. I don't know. Well, of course, I he. Know. I mean, he actually claimed that he has uh, uh, Jewish roots. Um, didn't he claim well, that he has uh, he uh, down? It's the mitochondrial uh, DNA from his his mother's side that uh, that's yeah. where he has the Jewish roots. 
Mate, you know, if you if you go and look at people's family trees, you know, if you look at your family tree, you've got two parents, then you look at them and there's there's four parents from them, and then you take that back and then the, you go back about ten generations and you're writing a family tree, and at the top of the page on ten generations, you've got about hundred and fifty to two hundred people across the top. You know, on on, on ten generations. Not even that. I think you got more, probably three hundred people across the top on ten generations. You go back you go back um, five hundred years. And you're going to find that everybody is interrelated to everybody. Ultimately, we've all got little bits of mitochondria of this and that through all of us because it's, it's, this is an enclosed environment, you know. So everybody's related to everybody. You, you can't really, you know, it's ridiculous some of these stuff. You know, there's little bits of this and little bits of that. We, you know, we're just human. We're just human. And there are thousands of Jews, tens of thousands of Jews in Israel who absolutely detest their government, who absolutely hate what's going on. Precisely. And who protest Precisely. what's going on. There are thousands of Jews in jail for not serving in the military because they will not kill Palestinians. So, And these are still people who identify themselves as Jews. So you can't say all Jews are bad like a lot of people do. Um, I, I really believe it is, it is the Zionist mentality. Unfortunately, though, the Zionist mentality... If you really look at, um, you know, within, within Judaism, there is an element of extremism, which would be those who really uh, follow the Tal- Talmudic teachings. And really, that's what Zionism is. It's a, it's a, a ridiculous um, uh, extremist version of the Talmud is really what it is. So you could say there are people who say, well, Zionism is actually true Jew- Jewish. This is what the Jews really believe. Well, it's what the Talmudic Jews really believe. And these are more of the Khazarian type of Jews. So I think it's, I think it's counterproductive to condemn an entire race of people. I, I've got video footage that's smuggled out to me from West Bank by Jewish people who are in, totally in support of the Palestinian cause. So the, the problem isn't with the Jewish people. The problem is with elements of extremism that exist within the Judaic faith. And elements of extremism exist within all faiths. Well, I mean, you, you, you can't say they don't. I mean, there's Christian extremists. Look at the look at the Spanish Inquisition. We know there's Islamic extremists. Of course, there's Jew, Jewish extremists. You know, to say there isn't is, is to simply deny reality, and that's the problem. And, and the but the extremists are, are the cancer, um, and uh, you know, and, and as we know, um, you know, cancer can be cured. Um, so you know, there ultimately there there is a solution, but uh, you know, we're not going to find that solution whilst we've got the uh, likes of David Cameron declaring himself uh, to be a Zionist. You know, uh, I mean, so many of the uh, leadership in the British government <coughs> are uh, signed up members of the Friends of Israel. You know, we know that in the US, the first place that any uh, political candidate or presidential candidate goes to is to APAC, the America Israel Public Affairs Committee, because they know that unless they get the support of APAC, they haven't got a cat's chance in hell of, um, of, of winning. I mean, and we know it's, the winning is not determined by the, uh, the election, but uh, you know, by the manipulation. And it's APAC who effectively are the, the primary manipulators you know, behind the, uh, the ultimate result. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was pretty much the same you know, in the UK. But you know, we, ha- we absolutely have to eradicate this extremist cancer. And you know what you were talking about just now, Max, where the um, event of the uh, on the the bus in the West Bank that didn't happen. I mean, you know, it, it's just becoming more and more outrageous now because they haven't got the events that they want. Not just in uh, Israel, but here in the UK. Uh, last Thursday at the um, November fifth marches, the establishment wanted to portray a violent riot. So we actually have the photographs of a decommissioned police car being towed into position so that it could be set alight by the police, by the agent provocateurs, so that the media had its coverage the following day of a, uh, a, a violence being perpetrated by the protesters. Yeah, look, that is just so typical of what they do. And, and this is what they're doing in, in Gaza and, and West Bank, mainly in West Bank at the moment. I mean, West Bank is, is really, really suffering at the moment. And they're just killing any Palestinian they want and then calling out knife attack. A couple, last week they said, oh, there's a, two Palestinians got into a bus station and started shooting and stabbing people. Okay, well, for a start, you've got to go through a checkpoint with 10 guards on it armed soldiers on this checkpoint who are going to go through everything that you've got. They even make the men take their pants off 
this is how you know, how much they humiliate these people. They take their shoes off, they take their pants off, all sorts of stuff, just to get through the checkpoint. And then they got to walk through a metal detector. So how on earth did these Palestinians get the knife and the gun into the bus station in order to start all this killing? And then we see the video footage, and what do we see? We see two dead Palestinians. We don't see any dead Jews. We don't see any stabbed Jews. We don't see any Jew up uh, clean up of Jewish blood. Because Jewish blood, this is something people don't realize as well, um, there's a special cleanup that has to happen for Jewish blood. If a Jewish person is stabbed in Israel, they need to bring in priests, the blood needs to be collected, there needs to be a special ritual held, held over the blood, and the blood needs to be taken and buried, because they believe their soul lives in their blood. Their soul exists in their blood, and they have higher souls, and so the, soul, the blood needs to be collected and, and buried. So you can always look at a, at a Jewish crime scene or a crime scene in Israel and see if there is a kosher cleanup of blood going on, whether there are rabbis there or they are wrapping bodies in Jewish cloth, which have to be all wrapped in Jewish cloth and got away from the crime scene and honored and all this sort of stuff that has to be done if they're Jewish. You don't see any of this at any of these crime scenes, so-called crime scenes. These are all staged. The whole thing is staged. They're just, uh, they're just shooting any Palestinian they want and, and crawling out knife attack. You've got gangs of settlers roaming around with, with, with in cars, with guns, just shooting any Palestinian they see and claiming knife attack. And it's all been spurred on by this bus attack. It's all been spurred on by Benjamin Netanyahu. The violence we're seeing in, Bank, in West Bank, and they're talking about the incitement of violence, the incitement of violence comes from Benjamin Netanyahu and his government, all of it, every single bit of it. You get the Palestinian people and you repress them and repress them and repress them, bulldoze their homes, torture their children, kill their husbands, kill their wives, and they react. How do you expect people to react? You know, you take every single piece of hope away you have from someone and you keep, keep pushing them, eventually they're going to erupt, erupt and it's going to boil over. And they're saying, oh, they said, you know, as soon as you recognise Palestine, we're going to see an escalation of violence in West Bank. And then Benjamin Netanyahu goes in and makes sure that they start responding because he's just wiping out so many areas. He's wiped out 72 uh, Palestinians, I think, since the beginning of this month. He's, he's killed 72 Palestinians. There's been something like um, five or six Jewish people killed as a response. But the, the terrorists in this situation are the settlers. There are 900,000 illegal settlements in Palestine at the moment. Palestine is almost gone. They've been crying for a two-state solution and saying we're working for a peace process for 23 years now and nothing nothing is happening. And and the Palestinian people are going, well, you know, we've tried all the political processes, we've tried everything. All we've got left to do is to try to die with some dignity. And that's the unfortunate reality of the situation. And it's all being supported by our government. You know, these Friends of Israel, we know what to start and renaming their company Friends of War Crimes, because that's what they are. They're Friends of War Crimes. Any politician who signs the pledge that he will support Israel is signing a pledge to support war crimes and he needs to be arrested simply for signing that pledge and daring to get a position in the United States government. How dare you sign a pledge saying well, you will give your allegiance to a foreign power and then expect to get employed in this government. How ironic is that and how outrageous is that and how stupid are the people of America for allowing it to happen? And I say, oh, well, we can't do anything about it. Yes, you can. You can withdraw all support from your government pending an investigation into the war crimes that they are committing. Call Obama a war criminal because he is. Call you know, Ron Emanuel a war criminal. Call all these people war criminals because that's what they are. Friend of Israel is a friend of war crimes. It's a friend of genocide. It's a friend of terrorism. It's a friend of child abuse. And we need to start renaming these organizations and, and starting our own movements and, and, and getting this out to people, getting this word out to people. We've got to stop, we've got to stop supporting this. And Palestine, I, I concentrate on it so much, Ian, because like I said, it's the key. It's the golden key. If you want to stop the fracking in your country, you want to stop the austerity measures, you want to stop them cutting a hole through the barrier reef and all the stuff that they're doing here. All of this, this legislation which allows all of this to happen is all written by the same people and they are all supporters of the war crime which is the existence of Gaza Strip, breach of Article 33, collective punishment. It's not acceptable. It's not tolerable. And the fact that it's happening, it gives us a reason and a legal right to remove all of these people and to roll back every piece of legislation they've written. But if people don't open their hearts and call it, it's not going to happen, you know. And there's too much of this, oh, it's, it's, it's hate the Jews stuff. It's not, forget about, forget about the ethnicity of it. Forget about the religion. Forget about all of that. Just put it back into a human perspective. It's children in prison, average age 17, and we have the ability to fix it. We could heal it very quickly if we call it out. You know, we've got to put down our fear and do it. And, and by doing that, we can address every social issue that we've got. You know, we can address them all in the one go. I really believe it's, it's a key for us, Ian.
I absolutely concur, Max. Hey, Max, I just want to um, endorse what you were saying and give people the graphic illustration of um, just how Palestine is effectively being eradicated. And, and there's no other word for it. I mean, you know, this was uh, Palestine pre um, the establishment of the state of Israel. And then this is as per... Um, 1947, the split here, this was Gaza, and uh, this was, uh, well, effectively the West Bank. So, you know, that was the largest part of Palestine. And then um, up until, uh, right up until the 67 war, basically, they were eroding it. But then after 67, of course, then basically they've just gone hell for leather. And of course, you know, what people don't realise today is that Gaza is the largest single contiguous part of Palestine because the West Bank has been so broken up. What it's done is it's effectively isolated communities. It's made travel, um, you know, a, a real nightmare for the Palestinians. I mean, it is literally a war of attrition. And obviously they're trying to, uh, you know, just sh shrink the state into non-existence. But Max, I, I just want to remind people that uh, you know it, it, it is um, Britain that is responsible for this um, current Holocaust, and uh, th this was due to um, Balfour and Milner signing the uh, Balfour Treaty in return for the Zionists manipulating America into the First World War. Britain was on its uppers in uh, 1916. Uh, there was a period where literally uh, the UK only had about uh, six weeks of food supply. And in fact, uh, Lloyd George was on the brink of actually negotiating with the Kaiser because the Kaiser had put forward a proposition to simply return to the pre-1914 um, borders. But the Zionists approached Lloyd George and said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. We can bring America into the war. And uh, in return, what we want is a commitment that the British government will do everything within its power to help create the state of Israel. And this is the Balfour Treaty. And it's, it's, this is all it is. This, it's this document that is responsible for everything that is occurring in the Middle East right now. And it, it reads, so this is November the 2nd, 1917. Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's Government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet. His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this objective. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which can prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. So, you know, let's, let's of course, um, knock the myth on the head that this declaration was anything other than an agreement with the Zionist Federation. And of course, the Zionists have effectively, conveniently, totally ignored the last part of the second paragraph, which, uh, and I repeat, it states, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which can prejudice, or which may prejudice, the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Yeah, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Then they arrived there with guns and they began a brutal program of ethnic cleansing. You know, and, and the whole of, of Israel was founded on a lie and it's been built on terrorism. It, it really has. And it's, it's, a, it's a pariah. It's, a, it's like an ulcer on, on the face of the world. It really is. And it could be fixed and it, it must be fixed. And um, yeah, Balfour Declaration, that's where it all started. I mean, actually, it actually goes back before that. I mean, that's where they made the agreement to actually do it. But if you take it back to about 1848, I mean, it, it, they really started putting the pieces together 
in the middle of the of the previous century. And um, if you really look at World War One and World War Two, it was the same war. It was the one war. Sure. You know, the the uh, the, the the aftermath of World War One created the situation where World War Two had to happen. You know, it absolutely had to happen. And another part about World War Two that people don't realise, of course, you would know, is that uh, World Jury actually declared war on Germany in 1933. Exactly. So it wasn't it wasn't even the Germans who started it. It was the Jewish community. So. Uh, and, and there's so many other factors. I mean, what was going on in Croatia, and, and there's so many factors. This is a whole, this is a, a three-hour show. So uh, pe- people have, have not been, been told any truth at all about what's happened in, in World War II in the last century. I mean, history is written by the winners, and the only way out of this mess, Ian, is for us to stand up and call it. People have to get involved themselves. They've got to put down their fear. They've got to realise that they don't have rulers. There's just people in suits who are employed to positions of management who are all in abuse of office, all in breach of trust, all committing war crimes and all doing terrible, terrible things. And we have the ability to call it out. Now, our biggest problem is that we don't have respectful enough communities to be able to have a united response, you know. We've got the people over the fence, we're arguing with them, all the neighbours hate each other everywhere because they're trained to do so, you know. So we've got, to, we've got to have this cohesion, this united response, which is what I've been trying to do with Full Circle Project, what I've been trying to do for a long time is just to unite people together into a common focal point, into a common movement, find people in your area, find a support group and stand up and start making a noise because that's, that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a lot of noise to fix this situation. Well, and you know, sometimes the catalyst is, is maybe something that um, can appear quite noddy in the scheme of things. And, and that's why in many respects, you know, the unconventional gas agenda um, is, is a gift because it mm. has brought communities together. I mean, not just in the, uh, in the UK, but uh, I mean, in the US, in Australia, in Canada, uh, in Poland, uh, you know, it's brought communities together like nothing before. Now, now the challenge is that having got the communities together is to try to encourage those communities to actually educate themselves on some of the deeper issues than just those which uh, impact upon their immediate environs. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's being able to look at it on a global stage and, and realise that, you know, we've been trying to have compartmentalised responses to all of this. You know, if we're looking at unconventional gas and we've got this little pathway, we, we're, that's our focal point, and we look at all the legal pathways leading from that point back to government, how we might be able to fix it, we petition the companies, we do all this, we block the wells. I mean, all these things have to be done. But we've really got to look at it and think, well, the, the reason that the unconventional gas company is here to begin with is because some politician wrote legislation on a piece of paper which allowed it to happen. And we can look at that and we can go, well, this guy actually supports Israel as well. So this guy's a war criminal. So how is his legislation valid? All we have to do is call out Article 33. But people have to be aware of it. The, the problem is that you, know, you, you get stuck behind this whole concept of anti-Semitism and all, this sort of, all these things that have been created to allow Israel to get away with what it's doing. And you've got to understand the people who are running Israel, these aren't even real Jews. These are Khazars. These are people who are using the whole Jewish mechanism and the Holocaust and everything. They've got this whole scenario worked out so that they can just go out and, and run roughshod, roughshod over the whole world and then call out anti-Semitism to anybody who speaks against them. But what they're doing is, is the most anti-Semitic thing on the planet. I mean, they're wiping out all the Semitic races in the area. So it, it's this whole double speak that they're using. And people are too afraid to call it out because they're too afraid of the stigma that goes with being called an anti-Semite or a Holocaust denier or all this. So these are all loaded terms, you know, even Holocaust denial. To question something is not to deny it. And, and even the word denial, this is a loaded term, denial. You're, you're, denial is something, you, you're, you're denying reality. Well, hang on, is it reality, you know? To even label something as, as a denier, this is such a loaded term, you know. And they've been very, very clever the way they've done this because it's created this, this whole taboo thing where it's just somewhere where you don't go because this is this is political suicide, it's social suicide, it's economic suicide, business suicide. You cannot go there and talk about this thing. And this is the only event in history you're not really allowed to talk about. So they've created this whole scenario where you just can't speak out against the state of Israel. And if you do, you get called someone who hates Jews, but really they're not Jews who are doing it. The Jews are as much victims in this as anybody else. Absolutely. I mean, look at that bus. That bus attack that I was talking about, there were hundreds of police. That, that, that fake bus attack, they had 50 ambulances there within a minute. 50 ambulances there within 60 seconds. 
And this is on a road that's got a speed bump every 10 feet. Hmm. There's no way you can get ambulances there that quickly. They had 50 ambulances and, and 400 police and military there within 60 seconds of this so-called bus attack happening. And that's done for all of the Jewish inhabitants of the area so that they can see there's this big commotion. They need to hear shooting. They need to hear sirens. They need to see lots of police and lots of ambulance because they need to believe that all these Jewish people have just been killed. Every time they lift the air raid sirens to say there's rocket attacks that aren't coming, it terrorizes all of the Jewish population and it also makes them hate the Palestinians. And there's also guys that go to these events and stand there and just scream out hatred towards the Palestinians to add all the rest of the crowd onto hating the Palestinians. And they're paid to do it. There's guys, there was a video that was released, uh, you might have seen it, a horrific video of it, a child with a, a bullet through his neck who was lying on a train station with his legs bent behind him. And there was a, 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 a man screaming at him to die. Um, this is the same man who was at the bus attack. You can hear it. It's the same mm -hmm. voice and he's screaming there for all the Arabs to die. And he's, a, he's an agent provocateur that's actually paid by the Israeli government because there's certain people in the crowd that the, the soldiers come and hand water to. They only give water to their employees. They won't give water to the normal people in the crowd, but they hand bottles of water to certain people in the crowd. The crisis actors. These are, yeah, these are the crisis actors and they're agent provocateurs that are there to scream out hatred and whip up the crowd to hating the, the Palestinians and the Arabs. You know, I've got people there who live in, in Jerusalem who remember the days when they used to get on fine with all the Arabs and fine with all the Palestinians, and they remember the days when the soldiers came and put up barricades and told them not to go into the Arab regions because they were all cutthroats. And they're going, but we know they're not. We, we were there yesterday. We go there all the time. And gradually they got convinced and they got turned around and it was the soldiers and the government who created the whole situation. And it's all about portraying the Palestinians as, as, as uh, terrorists so that Israel can cry victim, so it continued continue to expand its territories in the name of self-defense. And, and it's the oh, same croc, respect, Max, right. that's being perpetrated uh, here in the UK. Um, you know, they, 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 they try to um, uh, claim that knife crime against the Jewish community is on the rise. This is a croc of crap. And um, mm. in the Jewish community in North London, which is primarily an Orthodox uh, Jewish community, uh, they now have their own private security there that looks remarkably like um, the police. So, you know, you could be confused uh, that uh, with these uh, private security, you could confuse them with um, proper police. But, you know, the Arab community is not that far down the road. And you can see that, you know, the, there are elements within the establishment who are trying to fester ill feeling between the Arab community and the primarily Orthodox Jewish community, and both communities are basically going, you know what, you know, we get on fine. You know, we coexist. Yeah. We've coexisted <laughs> in these areas for years. There isn't a problem. But, of course, Netanyahu wants to create the impression in all of these countries that there is a problem because he wants these Jews to um, immigrate into Israel and, of course, bring their... Uh, respective wealth with them. And of course, they have no intention of going to Israel. I mean, they're Jewish. And of course, for most of these people, they actually believe that it is not right, particularly the Orthodox Jews, they believe that it's not right that Israel exists as a state. Because they, exactly. their fundamental belief is that God said, basically, you should uh, not um, uh, be uh, bogged down by the matters of state, but you should, uh, you know, be the diaspora and spread out through the world. Yeah, well, see, it's it's all it's all created. The whole thing is controlled. See, Bibi Netanyahu wants all the Jews to come home, and that's why he's doing what he's doing. That's why he's ramping up the violence so much because he wants to create animosity in the in the communities. He wants people walking around in London hating all the Jews because of what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. He wants this because then they will feel like, oh my God, we're persecuted. You know, he, he creates the whole situation. He's running through the Revelation script. He's the worst thing that's ever happened to to Israel. He's one of the worst things that's ever happened to the world. He's a blatant war criminal. He's a brutal sociopath, psychopath. I mean, the man needs to be taken to the Hague and he needs to be hung immediately. He, he's, a, he's a disgrace, absolute disgrace. And he's, he's, he's working to bring all the Jews home, but really what he's going to do is he's going to bring about the implosion of the state of Israel because Israel is going to find it very, very hard to recover from the Netanyahu regime no matter what it does in the future. There are so many people who know about this now, who are spreading information now, who have got this in memory and are going to keep pushing for it. 
And the more they do to try to stop it, the more people they're just waking up. So, you know, if Israel wants to survive at all, it needs to do something about this this rogue government run by this child killing psychopath and put someone of some sanity in place. And it needs to become a, a democratic nation. You know, I mean, democracy, we go through all these races, Democ- democracy is rubbish anyway, but, it, but at least you've got an equal vote. And in the moment, you don't have that in, in Palestine. You can't have a two-state solution. You can't have this, this totally oppressive Israel living next to this tiny little underdog Palestine. You need one state where there are equal rights for all. So therefore, it cannot be a Jewish state. It needs to be an open state, an open democracy where all religious persuasions are allowed and all social standards are allowed, anything like that. It should be allowed. You, you can't have a, a Jewish state because having any type of religious state is a supremacist state. And people may argue and say, oh, well, there's Islamic states around like, like uh, Iran. Well, yeah, Iran's run by an Ayatollah, but it's not an Islamic state. There's Christian communities and Jewish communities that live in Iran who are very, very happy to be there. There's a massive Jewish community in Iran who does not want to know about going back to Israel. They're very, very happy where they are living in Iran. So it's an, And because they have equal rights in Iran, they have the same rights in Iran as what the Islamic people do. But if you go to Israel, you've got to be Jewish to have rights. You can't be a Palestinian, you can't be a Christian and expect the same rights as the Jewish people because the Jewish people are special. That's the way they do it. You can't have a state based on that, that ideology. It's a supremacist ideology and it's not going to work. And you certainly can't go into another country and steal their country to set this up, which is what's happened. But, you know, like I said, and this is an opportunity for all of us. You know, all of these politicians are supporting this. They're all war criminals. And we've got to rein these governments back under control. We've got to stop them destroying our water table with unconventional gas. We've got to stop them cutting out the holes through the Barrier Reef. We've got to stop them destroying our groundwater, waging all these wars, killing all these people. This whole AI technocratic system that they bring in, the chemtrails, the spraying in the sky. I've been received some photographs from a friend of mine, I think in Arizona, the other day, and she showed me her back field in the morning with a dew fall on it. It looks like the whole field is covered in spider webs, mm. but they're not spider webs. They're not spider they're fibers. webs. They're fibers. They're yeah. fibers that fall from the sky yeah. in the night. There's no way this many spiders gets out and weaves these millions upon millions of webs across the back lawn. Yeah. These are fibers coming down from the chemtrails. The only way to stop all this, Ian, is to, is to be able to rein this entire cacistocracy back under control. And the key to do that is Gaza Strip. That's what it's for. I believe that that's what this is it, providing mankind with a golden opportunity to be able to address every single problem that we've got in one go if we could just open up our hearts to these people and call things for what they are and stop being politically correct. It's, you withdraw support from your politicians. I recommend everybody withdraw all support Stop paying any taxes any way you can. Stop voting. Tell these people you won't vote for anybody until they can show you why they are supporting war crimes. And don't take an argument from them that we're not war criminals. Well, do you support Israel? Fine. You're a war criminal because here's a copy of the Fourth Geneva Convention, Article 33, which says collective punishment is a war crime and I give you Gaza Strip. You support Israel. You support Gaza Strip. You support what they're doing in West Bank, the illegal settlements. This is all breaches of the Fourth Geneva Convention. So, you know, if, if any of their legislation is going to mean anything, well, this this needs to be looked at. And we have the moral and legal duty to, to do this ourselves and to call this out. Because if we don't, and we choose to be politically correct over this, and we choose to go down the pathways that they give us, then we're just allowing a prison to be built around us, and we deserve what we get. We really do. We've got to call this out for what it is. This is a humanitarian catastrophe of the worst kind, and we have the ability to call it and to do something about it. I mean, sure, you might get a little bit roughed up. Happened to me, but I'm pretty good for it. It's just made my voice stronger. I mean, these ribs are sore, but they'll, they'll heal. You know, I'll be right. Another, another five or six weeks, I'll be good again, and I'll be back out there on the front line. And everybody needs to do it. You know, you're only, you're only here once, folks. And, you know, the, the ultimate part of life that's going to happen is death. It's about how you live that life, you know. I mean, what does life equal? Life equals death. That's what it equals. It's what you do with it. You know, I'm not, and I'm not going to go through my life cowering in fear of death. I'm going to make a difference while I'm here. I'm going to call things what they are. I'm going to leave the world a better place than the way I found it. And we all have the opportunity to do that. And we've been given every tool we need to fix this planet if we could just open up our hearts. And if we don't, look, I keep saying the way of Palestine will be the way of the world.
Sadly, it will, Max. And the good news is, though, that uh, increasingly the community that is um, making an effort to bring about the changes we all know we need to see is, is growing exponentially. And that's why the socio psychopaths are upping their game. They're increasing their attacks. They're becoming more and more overt. Allah, you're uh, kicking in, um, in the restaurant last week. But uh, you're right, it doesn't matter how they attack us. I mean, my guest on Fracking Nightmare tonight, uh, Vera Scroggins from Pennsylvania, um, they're trying to uh, effectively make her, uh, drive her into economic poverty. We've got the same deal here with the, um, one of the gas companies trying to uh, force me into bankruptcy with, uh, with court costs for challenging them. But, you know, hey, listen, uh, you and I both know that ultimately, you know, the legacy that we leave future generations has to be different from the, the current track that uh, we're on. And um, I believe that we will do it. We've got a hell of a battle for sure. But I, if I didn't think that we would succeed, I'd be doing something a bit different. But Max, we're, we're out of time. Um, I just very quickly want to um, uh, draw people's attention to an event. This is um, hot off the press. And, uh, the, you know, you, you are going to be one of the uh, speakers at this event. So after six alternative view events in the UK, and, and of course, we have AV7 in the UK next May. But we have AV America, the first AV America event, which will be in Portland, Oregon, on the uh, 23rd and 24th of April. Uh, the website's not live yet. It will be live by the end of November. And the website is www avamerica.org but uh, you'll be there with us Max and um, uh, yeah by the way that's in 2016 uh, just in case anyone's watching this on YouTube after after that date so that's uh, April 23rd 24th 2016 not 2015 as it actually says on the graphic there so uh, thanks to um, Mike my uh, technician here for pointing that out to me Max as always an absolute pleasure my friend it's great to see you in such a uh, fine form despite your um, physical uh, trauma uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, I'm looking forward to hooking up with you next April if not before yeah it'd be good it'd be good to see you mate it's always a pleasure to come and talk to you thanks for thanks for getting me up so early <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, well you can go back to bed now so uh, that's Max Egan and uh, you can um, uh, check out Max just put into the search engine Max Egan and uh, you'll find his website, you'll find his YouTube channel, and you'll find his radio shows. And Max is always worth listening to. So uh, thanks for joining us this evening. And for my regular viewers, I'll see you at nine o'clock with Fracking Nightmare.